Hey guys, this is Agent Mindstorm, and welcome back to my Bedrock Edition resource pack tutorial. This video is about using advanced paint.net features to create more advanced textures. If you don't have paint.net installed yet, go watch the previous video, which is linked in the playlist in the description. Anyways, let's get started. Once you're back in paint.net, we're going to learn about some of the other tools you can use. Before that, though, you need to know the image viewing controls. To zoom in and out, either use the zoom tool or hold the control key and turn your mouse's scroll wheel. You'll zoom into or out of wherever your mouse is pointing on the image. To move your canvas across the screen, you can either use the pan tool, whose shortcut is H, or just click and hold the mouse wheel. To undo changes you made, press Ctrl Z. And to undo the undos, which is called redoing, press Ctrl Y. The first tool we're going to focus on is the paint bucket, which is the fill tool, whose shortcut is F. This is an incredibly simple tool that is very useful. The basic principle is that if you draw an outline of a shape with the pencil, then switch to the paint bucket and click inside the shape, it will fill the shape with the color you choose. The problem is that doing that fill expands the edges of the shape, and when working with small textures, you don't want this to happen. You can fix this with the fill tool options. They're on this bar at the top of the screen. The one that controls whether or not the shape is slightly expanded is this bendy line with three points. This means your shape is being anti-aliased, or smoothed, so it will look better at higher resolutions. Since Minecraft isn't known for its high resolution textures, you can turn that off by clicking on it. Now filling the shape doesn't expand it whatsoever. Another important function is the tolerance bar. This controls how many different colors will be filled at once. As an example, here's a circle that has a few different layers of color. With a higher tolerance, the entire shape is filled. When you lower that tolerance, less of the different shades are chosen. When the tolerance is 0%, only pixels that match the exact color of what you picked will be changed. The drop-down menu that says Fill Solid Color is used for repeating patterns. You can draw a bunch of lines or diagonal lines or only fill 75% of the pixels. Personally, I never use this setting, but in a more geometrically focused or pattern-focused texture style, it seems very useful. The final option, Flood Mode, is one that I use a lot. Changing it to Global changes the paint bucket, so instead of filling every pixel of a certain color in the area, it fills every pixel of a certain color in the entire image. This really helps when making textures that are the same pattern, but have different colors, like wool or wood types, but we'll get into that later. The next tool we're going to focus on is the Selection Tool. This is actually a group of six tools, but they're all related to each other. The most important one, though, is the basic selection tool, which is called Rectangle Select. Its shortcut key is S. Just clicking and dragging across the canvas will draw a rectangle like you do on the desktop when you're bored. Press Escape to deselect all, and press Delete to get rid of the selected pixels. The next selection tool is the Lasso Select. Press S twice to switch to it. This tool lets you draw freely, but always draws a line straight back to the starting point, which allows you to select more complex shapes. The final selection tool is the ellipse, and since Minecraft doesn't have circles, it's pretty much useless. Its shortcut is SSS, which you probably should have guessed by this point. Each selection tool has options at the top of the screen. The selection quality tool on the far right decides whether or not it will create semi-transparent pixels. We want to turn that to pixelated to work best with Minecraft textures. These five options to the left decide the mode of the selection tool. The main one is already selected, which is replace. It means that when you start making a selection, the previous selection will be instantly deselected. All these other options change that. The first one, add, will let you make as many selections as you want. They still count as one selection, though. The second one, subtract, causes any selection that overlaps your existing selection to be removed. The third, Intersect, allows you to limit your selection to the area inside another selection. And the fourth, Invert, makes anything inside your selection that isn't selected become selected, and anything that is selected gets deselected. This one lets you make some weird shapes. The Rectangular Selection tool gets an extra option, which allows you to set it to a specific ratio or pixel size for the selection. This is great if you want to select only square areas, in which case you can just set the ratio to 1 by 1. If you're trying to edit an animated texture, which has many different 16x16 16 16 sections, you can just set the size to 16 pixels to make sure you always have the right areas selected. 
the magic wand is the final selection tool, its shortcut is... Now, brace yourself for this one. SSSS. It has the same options as the first three had, but has extra op ones from the fill tool, such as tolerance and flood mode. It also has this last option, sampling. The image setting makes the selector follow the same rules as the fill tool, so I recommend that one. The layer option makes the wand attempt to select entire layers, and it's just really convoluted, so... You know what? Just leave that option alone, and you'll probably be fine. In order to move the pixels that you just selected, use the Move Selected Pixels tool, with whose shortcut is M. Even if your selections aren't connected, they all get moved as one. Hold down right-click to rotate the selection, and you can resize the selection with the circles around the corners. Those are called handles, but no one ever calls them that. When you're finished moving your pixels, press Escape to confirm the change. If you want to move the selection but not the pixels under it, you can use the Move Selection button, whose shortcut is MM. This only moves the selection, and it also lets you resize and rotate it. If you switch which layer you're currently drawing on, the selection will move to that layer. I've made this mistake a lot of times, so always make sure you're on the correct layer for what you're trying to select. That's a lot of stuff to remember, but we aren't quite done yet. The final process we need to know how to use correctly for editing textures is how to resize the image. Under the Image tab at the top of the screen, you can see a lot of options. Most of these are self-explanatory, but a few need some extra explaining. Crop Image to Selection will make the part of the image that you've selected become the entire image. This can be undone with Control z so you can mess around with it as much as you want. Resize is a little bit more complicated. This will take your image and stretch it to fit the new area you choose for it. It automatically applies anti-aliasing unless you change this drop-down menu that says Resampling to Nearest Neighbor. You can resize the image below there with either a percentage or the actual size. Percentage doesn't allow you to change the aspect ratio, which is the length of each side compared to the other side, so you can't stretch the image that way. Resizing by absolute size is a little different because you get so many more options. You can ignore the print size and resolution options because those are for printers, and I'm pretty sure you want printing out your Minecraft textures. That leaves us with three options. If you keep maintain aspect ratio on, it will automatically resize one side of the image when you change the other to match the image size before you resized it. When you turn maintain aspect ratio off, though, you can change the side lengths independently. The last option under the image tab that we need to talk about is canvas size. This acts exactly like the resize button except that it doesn't stretch or compress the image. It will either make white space around it if you make it bigger, or it will remove parts of your image if you make it smaller. Because of that, you can choose where the expansion will start with this little grid here. For example, if you choose the bottom left, no pixels will be added or removed on the left or bottom side of your image, but they will be added above and to the right. I usually keep this right in the middle, but you'll find what works best for you eventually. Wow, that was a lot of explaining to do. And I'm sure you're now asking, how does that help me create textures? And the fact is that you just learned most of the tools that you're going to use to create them. The selection tool allows you to move and rotate and copy entity parts. The fill tool allows you to recolor textures for many different blocks. The resize and canvas size buttons are great for people trying to make a higher resolution texture pack. For an example, let's do a color swap for a wool texture for one of my resource packs. We're going to change this white wool into magenta wool. I've opened my white wool texture and the default magenta wool texture in paint.net for this. First, I choose the fill tool. I disable anti-aliasing, set the tolerance to zero, and set the flood mode to global. I now switch to the default magenta wool texture and choose one of the pixels with the color picker tool. Next, I switch back to the white wool texture and pick one of the colors to replace. I then expand the color picker, slightly adjust the shade of the magenta, and replace another pixel. I repeat this process until the texture has been fully changed to magenta. I save it and the color swap is done! That's the end of this video's guide. Hopefully you found it useful, but for now, I do want to tell you all, thanks for watching, and I will see you later.